Thank you. Um, thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak with you today, and to thank also Professor Amaral and the organizers of this conference for inviting me. Uh, the U.S. transition to um, mass post-secondary education after World War II and its positive socioeconomic impacts on American society are often regarded as a primary motivation for the massification of other national systems of higher education over the last 25 years. However, while there are a number of estimable policies and practices in U.S. higher education, the effectiveness of current American policies governing access to higher education is more debatable. For example, the percentage of a recent U.S. high school graduates enrolled in colleges, colleges rose from 45% in 1960 to 67% in 1997, but the proportion has stagnated, stagnated since then, and the U.S. now trails a number of EU nations in the percentage of young adults who have completed tertiary education. In addition, American public schooling at the secondary level was traditionally perceived as more democratic than systems in Europe and contributed to the belief that social mobility was greater in the United States than in other developed nations. But these beliefs now clash with contemporary economic and demographic evidence indicating that a number of Scandinavian countries have both higher earnings mobility across generations and lower, lessons, lower levels of economic inequality than does the United States. The reasons for these observed differences in inequality, economic inequality and access to higher education in the European Union and the United States are complex. The Nobel laureate in economics, James Heckman, illustrates here the expected economic rates of return to society of various investments in human capital, which includes higher education. In most OECD nations, achieving a baccalaureate degree, as Professor Amaral earlier indicated, increasingly improves one's lifetime earnings. But effective health care, preschool education, and pre-college schooling also make a substantial impact on the social and economic success of lower income individuals. The design of these policies can also influence access to higher education. The U.S. varies from most European Union nations in not providing universal prenatal health care, nor universal preschool daycare and educational programs. In addition, the United States federal governance system places primary responsibility on the 50 states for the organization and financing of primary and secondary education. And within most states, school financing is largely by local property taxes. Consequently, low-income areas generally have poor quality schools at the primary and secondary level. Also, in comparison to many European Union nations, the U.S. has no national curriculum or exams for primary and secondary education, although independently developed standardized tests, such as the Scholastic Aptitude Test, the SAT, or the uh, Association of College Testing, the ACT test, are available to inform college entrance decisions in the 50 states. Finally, U.S. college and university admissions decisions are primarily the responsibility of each public and private institution. Some of the differences in college entrance policies were publicized by recent American court cases, which you may have read or heard about. One set of these cases revealed wealthy parents bribing corrupt testing and college officials to guarantee entry of their children into elite selective research universities. As Professor Amaral pointed out, those with money and power will try to sustain their money and power. These recent cases also confirmed research on access to selective U.S. college and universities, which has discovered biased admissions procedures favoring athletes, 
children of college alumni, or as is sometimes described, so-called legacies, uh, as well as the children of institutional faculty members. These observed biases in selective college and university entrance standards raise legitimate questions as to the equity and fairness of access to current U.S. higher education. Now, in public policy, or uh, equity or, uh, or fairness is often defined utilizing the economic concepts of horizontal and vertical equity, which is somewhat similar to the points Professor Amaral made. With regard access to higher education, horizontal equity can be conceived as the equal treatment of valid individual applicants. Contrastingly, vertical equity can, can, be, can be conceived as treating differently those valid higher education applicants with the greatest financial need. Both these forms of equity, both horizontal and vertical equity, are visible in higher education access policies in the U.S. as well as EU nations. Under the assumption one can learn from both public policy failures as well as public policy successes, I will review the research on equity of access in the United States, baccalaureate institutions of higher education, with an emphasis on three issues. First, financial aid policy. Second, informational and behavioral constraints for lower income applicants, points uh, Professor Callender mentioned yes, before. And I will be discussing, as mentioned, affirmative action programs in the United States. Let me make sure I have the right slide here. <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, yes. Um, now, I want to begin with the uh, theory and framework of Professor Nicholas Barr, an economist in, in England, who uh, Professor Callender also discussed. But I want to mention that uh, Barr's theory about um, uh, higher education policy, I think, is very useful. Uh, he has, uh, although he's, his name is often associated quite closely with the notion of income contingent loans, his larger theory, I think, is very helpful in understanding some of the difficulties and complexities of mass higher education and access. Uh, and I'll make, uh, I'll, I'll lay out some of the reasons why I'm using his theory and the criticisms of the U.S. The economist Nicholas Barr has provided an economic framework for evaluating the efficiency and equity of national policies supporting higher education. And these guidelines can be usefully applied to explicate U.S. financial aid policy. First, because it is now influential on national economic performance and on individual life chances, as several people have already mentioned. Countries need mass, high-quality higher education. Second, higher education is too complex for central planning. Therefore, institutions need to be able to charge differential tuition and fees, reflecting their different costs and objectives. Third, in order to maximize the social benefits of universal access, Barr recommends, as uh, has already been mentioned, Barr recommends tuition fees and student living costs initially be paid by government in the form of a student loan, thereby making higher education essentially free at access. Given the substantial private benefits they receive from higher education, these loans should then be repaid by the student after graduation based on their current earnings and collected with income taxes. These loans should also be progressive charging an appropriate interest rate and providing forgiveness after a period of time, such as 25 years, to those with low lifetime earnings. Finally, while Barr assumes a competitive market for mass higher education is most beneficial for society, this market needs, and this is important to emphasize, particularly following Professor Callender's uh, argument, this market needs, according to Barr, to be well regulated with regard quality and efficiency. For example, because prestigious institutions possess a degree of market power, Barr argues some form of regulation is needed on institutional tuition and fees. 
Now, consistent with BAR's framework, baccalaureate institutions in the U.S. do participate, as you know, in a competitive market, and therefore almost all colleges and universities charge tuition and fees in the United States. Federal, state, as well as institutional funds provide financial assistance to students in the form of scholarships and grants, so unlike uh, England currently, we offer scholarships and grants, as well as loans and student work study funds. That is, colleges and universities have um, money from the federal government that they can use to provide work study funds to students who work, for example, in the library or in uh, cafeterias. While scholarships and grants based upon academic merit are awarded throughout the United States, the vast majority of financial aid for higher education applicants is given on the basis of defined economic need, thereby reflecting the previously noted concept of vertical equity. However, BARS guidelines clarify some obvious inequities in the U.S. system for higher education. First, in the United States, there is no national regulation of tuition and fees in private higher education. While state governments often attempt to limit tuition fee increases in public colleges and universities, over the last 25 years, state appropriations per full-time equivalent student in the United States have declined by 8%, while net tuition per FTE student has increased by 96%. Therefore, public colleges and university fees in the United States now represent only, almost 50% of total public higher education revenue. Second, most U.S. college student loans are similar to mortgages, that is, they have fixed monthly repayments that begin immediately upon graduation and must be paid over a very short period of 10 years, unlike, for example, the loans in England. Consequently, the U.S. college loan system is regressive, not progressive, primarily because of the very large repayment burdens for low-earning bachelor's graduates early in their career student default rates now have risen to an all-time high in the United States. In contrast, under BAR's guidelines, the regular amount to be repaid by student borrowers should depend on their income, but it does not depend on their income in the United States. Uh, theoretically, this both protects low-earning graduates from experiencing financial difficulties or defaulting, as well as ensures that taxpayer subsidies are kept low or lower. Because of the rapidly rising costs of higher education in the United States, a number of states have adopted merit-based aid programs for their residents. These state programs represent the largest increase in U.S. financial aid spending over the last 20 years, since the last recession. Many of these programs fully cover tuition and fees at in-state public universities. Regardless of financial need, for applicants who meet a minimum grade point average or uh, a uh, national test standard of a certain st uh, size. These policies have been effective in increasing overall college enrollment, student academic performance, and degree attainment. But these merit-based state policies are regressive because a high proportion of the students receiving this tax-based financial assistance come from families of middle or upper class state residents who could readily afford higher education. As a consequence, for example, in the state of Georgia, where this uh, merit-based system has been implemented, the implementation of such a merit-based aid program lowered the proportion of minority and lower socioeconomic students enrolling in the state's public colleges and universities. In addition to regulating tuition and fees, BAR recommends effective regulation of academic quality assurance. The amount of U.S. college loans and the percentage of student default rates have rapidly risen since the last recession, but an important contributor to this problem are students enrolled in for-profit higher education. From 2002 to 2010, these institutions quadrupled their enrollment mainly by targeting relatively vulnerable 
and poorly informed populations such as African American, low income applicants, and first generation students. In comparison to nonprofit public and private institutions, for profit baccalaureate programs have very low student completion rates, poor graduate payments and relevant employment, and four times higher default rates on student federal loans as students attending traditional public and private colleges and universities. To address this problem, the Obama Administration Education Department in 2015 adopted a gainful employment regulation requiring vocational programs at for-profit higher education institutions to meet minimum thresholds for the debt to income rates of their graduates. For-profit vocational pro programs that failed to meet these requirements could lose access to all federal financial aid, putting them at a higher risk of closing. In 2016, the Education Department in the Obama administration also shut down the Accrediting Council for Independent Colleges and Schools, the nation's largest accreditor for for-profit colleges. But under the current Trump administration, these and related academic quality assurance regulations affecting for-profit higher education have been reversed. Some of you may know that uh, Trump, uh, before he became president, yeah, yeah, had set up the Trump, Trump Institute for Higher Education, which had to be closed because of high default rates. The U.S. higher education system is already characterized by colleges and universities with variable tuition and fees, market competition for student enrollment, and institutions with substantial autonomy on admissions policy. But the existing government financial aid system fails to provide fair access and often contributes to income inequality. Necessary reforms would include adopting a government-supported loan system covering tuition fees and living expenses for admitted baccalaureate students, similar to the UK, but perhaps um, more forgiving. Loan payments following student graduation would be based upon graduates' income and payable for an extended number of years through the national tax system. As of now, it's only a 10-year period. Such government financial aid would also require more extensive regulation of public and private baccalaureate colleges and universities to ensure acceptable academic quality, student progression and graduation rates, as well as gainful graduate employment. And I want to point out that um, there's a major debate going on now, as many of you know, between the European Union, which is trying under uh, a new uh, official to uh, more tightly regulate uh, IT-based uh, organizations such as Amazon and, uh, 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 and other uh, American companies. Uh, so what we're really encountering, I think, worldwide is the need for new forms of regulation to deal with contemporary economic and market circumstances. Uh, and this is the point of my paper to a certain extent. What is the nature of that regulation that's needed and how does it need to be changed? As an economist, Barr argues higher education applicants are generally well-informed or potentially well-informed consumers and that therefore better able than national planners to make choices which conform with their interests and those of the larger economy. This economic assumption has helped spawn the worldwide adoption of college and university league tables or rankings modeled initially after those published by the US News and World Report in America. Information provision is, positive, is likely to positively influence equitable access to higher education if quality rankings utilize measures linked with societally, societally valued educational outcomes, students use this information in their choice of subjects, and institutions respond to student choices by improving relevant academic programs. But many of the commercial rankings, and I haven't got the right one. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> the problem with my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Information, as I said, is likely if those conditions are met.
But many of the commercial rankings in the U.S. are not based on any testable theory or model of university educational performance. Instead, U.S. commercial rankings base their assessments primarily on indicators of academic prestige, such as the quality of enrolled students and of faculty research. Consequently, in the U.S., many colleges and universities have responded to these rankings not by efforts to improve the quality of student learning and academic programs, but by expending greater amounts of time and financial resources on marketing student admissions, as well as investments in athletics, residential facilities, and other amenities attractive to student applicants. These overinvestments in amenities contribute to the rapidly rising costs of U.S. higher education. The belief institutional transparency is an effective means of promoting access to higher education overlooks the evidence of what I would term the naive student consumer. And uh, in the paper I've written, I quote from a well-known psychological study, and I quote as follows, um, young adults who are particularly present-focused, impulsive, and experienced in handling complex tasks are the people making the choices as to what colleges and universities to attend. Or as a respected study of academic standards in the market-oriented U.S. higher education system concluded, and I quote again, there is no reason to expect that students and parents as consumers will prioritize undergraduate learning as an outcome, unquote. Furthermore, with regard to fairness of access, some U.S. institutions are seeking to improve their quality rankings by cream scheming student applicants, selecting the best achieving applicants as well as wealthier students most able to pay higher levels of tuition. In addition, the increasing focus of rankings on academic research as an indicator of institutional prestige has encouraged U.S. universities to increase their proportion of institutional funds expended on research at the same time as their proportion of institutional funds expended on instruction is declining. Now, one recent approach to college rankings in the U.S. offers a possible model for promoting fairer access. An index developed by the New York Times ranks selective colleges. These are colleges like Harvard or private colleges like Williams and uh, Swarthmore. Uh, selective U.S. colleges, those with a five-year graduation rate of at least 75%, ranks them on their commitment to economic diversity. This index is based on the Pell Grant, the largest federal scholarship in the United States, which is awarded to applicants uh, coming from roughly the bottom 50 or bottom 40 percent uh, of the national income distribution. All U.S. colleges and universities have to report publicly how many of their students receive these Pell Grants. This ranking indicates how many U.S. low and middle income students a college admits and graduates, as well as the true student net price less financial need aid. The index therefore provides an indicator of which selective institutions in the United States are doing the most to promote social mobility. The publication of this New York Times index has had some influence on college behavior. Until recently, Princeton was among the least economically diverse of the U.S. universities. Only 6.5% of the class of, entering class of 2007 was in the lower half of the national income distribution. But following the publication of these New York Times access rankings, the Princeton administration actively addressed this issue and the percentage of such entering students rose to 21% of the entering class. The graduation rates of these lower income students are comparable to the rate of other Princeton students. And as a result, Princeton is now also increasing its enrollment of middle-class U.S. students, as well as low-income foreign applicants. Now, Barr does argue, and I think we have to give him credit here, 
that while many higher education applicants are fully informed, this knowledge is less likely for students from poorer backgrounds. These behavioral constraints are evident in the United States where lower income students and parents possess less educational experience and receive poorer information than advantaged students. These constraints include student and parent understanding of the net price of selective colleges after considering financial aid. They include the academic preparation and test scores sought by selective colleges, that is, they have little knowledge of this. Um, they lack poor information about the importance of applying for financial aid. They have inadequate information about the characteristics of different colleges and majors, including graduation and job placements. And they are underinformed about the mechanics of college acceptance, including the, the logic of applying for multiple colleges. These are constraints that uh, lower income parents and students confront in the US. Taking the standardized college entrance exams is a key step in the US college application process. But an estimated 30% of students in the bottom income quartile do so, compared with 70% of students in the top income quartile. Students from many lower income families are much less likely to have college educated parents and possessing parents with this knowledge and experience is highly correlated with college applications in the US. Lower income parents are also more likely to be engaged in small family run businesses or farms, which often involve family members as workers. Therefore, these parents may be more debt averse, less accepting of both the potential financial loss to their business, as well as the costs of higher education associated with their ch children attending colleges. In addition, lower income US students and their less educated parents often find the process of applying for college financial aid in the United States complex and intimidating. All college applicants seeking US financial aid must submit uh, a federal student aid application, which is a complicated 12-page form. While federal student aid application rates have risen over time, substantial numbers of students eligible for the mentioned federal Pell Grants program failed to apply for it. Many federal financial aid applicants also file after required deadlines, decreasing the likelihood of receiving state and institutional aid for which they likely would be eligible. Another important issue in the United States is what we call undermatch, in which students enroll in an institution not well aligned to their academic skills and credentials. In the US, students attending more selective colleges and universities, such as the ones I just indicated in the New York Times Index, experience much richer instructional as well as extracurricular resources and are more likely to persist to graduation. But high achieving low income student, US students are often geographically isolated from other high achieving peers and therefore unlikely to encounter a teacher or a former schoolmate who attended a selective college. <laughs> Consequently, these students make application choices mirroring their socioeconomic rather than their academic peers and fail to apply to selective colleges and universities. As a consequence, it is likely the vast majority of high achieving students from low income families in the United States do not apply to a college or university which would best serve their needs as well as those of the parent society. Recognizing the limitations of information based guides and college rankings for student choice, as well as the behavioral characteristics of low income families, there have been a number of more active efforts to increase the equity of college access in the United States. These have included school-based programs providing access to national college testing for lower class students and targeted outreach financial aid counseling and admissions support for low income families. One carefully designed such outreach effort deserves very special attention. The Selective University of Michigan 
implemented and evaluated an outreach program designed to address the barriers of fair access experienced by high-achieving, uh, low-income U.S. students. Students eligible for this program were identified using information contained in state administrative databases on student grade point averages, standardized test scores, and family income. These data were available for two reasons. First, Michigan had recently required all public high school students to take a standardized college entrance test. Second, a student's participation in the federally subsidized school lunch program, which I take it is somewhat similar to the program in England, indicates they are from families with incomes below the federal poverty level. Based upon this available state information, the University of Michigan selected a sample of low-income rising senior students in the state who would qualify for both admissions to the University of Michigan and full financial aid. These students were randomly assigned to a pilot program group and a matched control group. The program group received personally addressed packets at their homes in early September of their senior year of high school. Students in the control group received only postcards listing the University of Michigan application deadlines. The material sent the program group were large, glossy, and brightly colored in the university's signature colors. The mailing included a letter from the university president encouraging the student to apply and promised a four-year full tuition and fees scholarship if the student was accepted. The packet also contained brochures explaining the application and admissions process as well as describing the University of Michigan experience. Materials clearly stated applicants did not have to complete the traditional complex federal financial aid form. Information about this offer from Michigan was also mailed to the student's parents and to high school principals of eligible students, asking them to encourage application for the scholarship. An analysis of the matched samples, the control group and the uh, uh, program group, revealed the impact of the Michigan program. Two-thirds of the high school students involved in the pilot program applied to the University of Michigan, compared with only a quarter of similar students in the control group. The share of those in the program who ultimately enrolled at the University of Michigan was 27% compared with 12% from the control group. Without the program initiative of the 15% of students who chose this selective University of Michigan program, 4% would not have gone to college at all 4% would have gone to a community college, a two-year college rather than a four-year baccalaureate degree, and 7% would have gone to a less selective four-year college. Those students participating in the scholarship program were also 13.5% more likely than those in the control group to continue their college enrollment for a second year. The researchers concluded an inexpensive, targeted, personalized outreach program can alter the college cho choices of high achieving low income students by lessening uncertainty about their suitability for an elite school, correcting their overestimates of the net cost of college, and lowering procedural barriers such as the complexity of U.S. financial aid forms. In sum, Research on informational and behavioral constraints for low-income college applicants in the U.S. raised serious questions about the assumption institutional transparency will effectively assure fair access in mass higher education. Unless rankings of colleges and universities are carefully designed to ensure they utilize valid measures linked with societally valued educational outcomes, there is a danger they will instead promote institutional inefficiency, and contribute to access inequality. Furthermore, policies to increase access for students of lower income need to involve more active, focused efforts directly related to their financial concerns. The effective outreach program at the University of Michigan further emphasizes the importance to fair access 
of simplicity, simplicity in the design of financial aid policies. This successful U.S. intervention is similar in spirit to the design of income contingent loan systems adopt, adopted in Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. Similar in the sense that these latter financial aid systems positively influence parent and student behavior in, on college access by making publicly obvious and uh, publicly obvious a family bears no formal responsibility for college financial support and all accepted college applicants will receive the funds necessary to attend higher education. Now a third relevant policy consideration for fair access is discrimination. From the perspective of horizontal equity, which I defined earlier, do valid applicants to U.S. colleges and universities receive equal individual consideration in the admissions process? Or is there a discrimination, for example, by student gender, ethnicity, or religion? Now, historically, uh, in the United States, see what I've got here. <laughs> One more? Yeah. Historically, in the United States, um, U.S. colleges and universities excluded racial minorities and women from access to higher education and also limited admission of religious groups such as Catholics and Jews. Because of this discrimination, separate colleges and universities were initially established to serve these excluded populations. In 1964, the U.S. Civil Rights Act outlawed discrimination in public and private firms based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Following this act, many colleges and universities voluntarily adopted policies seeking to increase recruitment of racial minorities um, under the banner of affirmative action. Initially, some of these admissions procedures included the use of racial quotas until the U.S. Supreme Court questioned their constitutionality. The court subsequently clarified race could be used as one of several factors in individual admissions decisions without necessarily violating the equal protection laws of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The court's original decision supporting diversity in higher education as a, quote, compelling interest, unquote, but as Justice O'Connor of the Supreme Court noted in a later Supreme Court decision, quote, we expect that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary to further the interests approved today. She said that in 2003. As access to higher education has become increasingly influential on a person's lifetime life chances, Public opposition to affirmative action in the U.S. college admissions has grown. A recent national survey reports 73% of Americans now say colleges and universities should not consider race or ethnicity when making decisions about student admissions. Reflecting this attitude, seven additional states have followed the University of California's 1996 I'm sorry, I got ahead here. Thanks. Um, as access to higher education has become increasingly influential on a person's life chances, public opposition to affirmative action in the U.S. college admissions has grown. And a recent national survey reports 73% of Americans now say colleges and universities should not consider race or ethnicity. Reflecting this attitude, seven additional states have followed California's 1996 decision to prohibit pre preferential treatment for applicants to state-supported universities on the basis of race, sex, ethnicity, or national origin. In the wake of these bans, the enrollment of underrepresented racial and ethnic minority students has decreased at selective U.S. colleges and universities. This decline of minority enrollment in selective colleges may be particularly damaging to society, to American society. As previously noted, selective U.S. colleges and universities are a better fit or match 
for high-achieving, low-income students who are more likely to progress and graduate from these institutions. Furthermore, an influential economic study uncovered an additional critical factor. The researchers discovered the higher average salaries over time predicted for graduates of highly selective U.S. universities were more a product of the talents of their admitted students than of their educational programs. That is, individuals accepted highly selective colleges who instead enrolled in less selective institutions had similar incomes over time as did the graduates of the elite schools. But Latino, black, and low-income students proved an exception. These minority students who were accepted in highly selective schools and instead attended less selective institutions had lower average salaries over time. The researchers believed networking opportunities available from attending a selective college may be particularly valuable for the life chances of black and Hispanic students and for students who come from families with lower levels of parental education. This positive influence of elite institutions may be especially important in the United States because since the first Supreme Court decision on affirmative action, there has been continued job discrimination, particularly for African Americans, as indicated by research on minority pay and job placement. The public reaction to possible bias for minorities in college admissions in the United States is largely, also largely uninformed by the existing admissions preferences at selective U.S. colleges and universities. As recent court cases on U.S. college admissions have suggested, and as substantive research has confirmed, there are as strong or stronger preferences in favor of recruited athletes, legacies, alumni children, and the children of institutional faculty and staff as there are for underrepresented minorities at America's most elite and selective colleges and universities. A recent court case involving Harvard University, one of the highest ranked and most selective universities in the United States, for the first time provided pu publicly available institutional data on domestic undergraduate applications and admissions. The table before you provides admit rates for U.S. applicants by race as well as by preference groups. The preference groups include recruited athletes, alumni children or legacies, children of Harvard faculty and staff, as well as the dean director's interest list. This dean's director interest list rates applicants to Harvard whose family has donated financially to Harvard and who are likely future donors. As the table indicates, there are or is some preference given to minority applicants over traditional white applicants. But these preferences are modest compared to the weight of other listed preference categories, uh, which, with the exception of Harvard children, tend to favor white applicants from higher income families. The Harvard preferences for athletes and legacies are common to admissions decisions and studied in other selective U.S. college, public and private colleges and universities. In the public mind, preferences for recruited athletes may be associated with minority enrollment because of the visibly high proportion of black students engaged in U.S. college and university football, basketball, and, traffic sp and track sports teams. But other than these specific sports teams at major universities, the vast majority of athletes recruited to selective and non-selective U.S. colleges and universities, including Harvard, are white students, not minority students. Furthermore, recruited athletes in many university sports are provided full tuition and fee scholarships, and these scholarships are awarded based on athletic ability, not financial need. From the perspective of fair access to higher education, the evidence of admission preferences in U.S. colleges and universities is difficult to defend. While the biases favoring athletes and legacies may be unique to the United States, the global development of mass higher education with competitive markets and academic rankings may induce other institutions to emulate the U.S. preferences 
awarded to wealthy donors and alumni. Harvard's stated rationale for its legacy preferences is as a means of sustaining alumni engagement reflected in their financial donations to the university as well as in their active volunteer efforts uh, to recruit and interview student applicants. It is also worth noting alumni financial donations is one of the quality measures used by the U.S. News and World Report College and University rankings. In their last college admissions ruling, the U.S. Supreme Court challenged the U.S. states and universities to find workable race-neutral strategies to achieve educationally beneficial diversity. Because members of U.S. minority groups are often low income, some scholars have advocated affirmative action admissions policies with preferences for socioeconomic class rather than race. A recent rigorous simulation study of socioeconomic-based admissions policy indicates it would benefit U.S. low-income applicants, but would not be as effective in aiding diversity as current race-sensitive university admissions policies. However, the researchers argued that the combination of a socioeconomic-based admissions policy with a program of targeted race-based recruiting and outreach offers the potential to yield racial diversity levels comparable to race-sensitive admissions practices. This type of targeting recruitment and outreach appears similar to the described effort at the University of Michigan. Now, this brief review of existing preferences in U.S. college and university admissions decisions reveals a number of policy issues of possible relevance to other nations. First, as other countries massify their higher education systems, many are also introducing tuition and fees, promoting market competition for students among universities, and awarding greater administrative autonomy to academic institutions. The existing preferences in U.S. admissions for students from wealthy alumni and families raise questions about access, fairness, and inequality, and these U.S. preferences emerged in a system characterized by institutional autonomy and market competition for students and financial resources. Second, the U.S. preferences embodied in affirmative actions admissions policies raise significant questions of horizontal equity. Preferences based on race and ethnicity have been defended within the U.S. legal system as compensatory policies necessitated by historical discrimination. There is evidence of similar policies regarding access of women to higher education, jobs, and professional opportunities emerging in some EU countries, and these were mentioned. As the migration of ethnic and religious minorities into developed nations continues to increase, which I'm sure it will, it is likely these countries may also confront issues of discrimination, policy debate, and public reaction similar to those experienced in the United States. For this not reason, knowledge about the U.S. experience with affirmative action policy in college and university admissions may be of value to you all. Now let me conclude. Um, the U.S. experience on access, inequality, and higher education admissions suggests the following policy design issues for mass systems of higher education in developed nations. The evidence of increased income inequality in many countries supports the view students economically benefiting from public provision of baccalaureate degrees should pay an appropriate proportion of their higher education expenses. Relevant financial assistance for tuition fees and living expenses should be available to all valid higher education applicants through financial aid consisting of scholarships and grants based upon academic merit and government-supported loans. Eligibility for higher education and financial aid should be as simple as possible and publicly clear. Second, government-supported student loans should be repaid by graduates through the national tax system and automatically adjusted for earned income. Loans should be repaid for a set period, for example, 25 years as in the UK, and reflect vertical equity. That is, graduates with higher income should pay more than graduates with lower income. The government loan system should be designed to minimize any public subsidy. Third, government regulation of fair access should include appropriate means for assuring the efficiency of publicly supported higher education tuition and fees. 
processes for reforming and strengthening each institution's collegial processes for improving the quality of teaching and student learning, monitoring the integrity of institutional admissions decisions, and finally assuring the validity and societal value of publicly available information on institutions of higher education. And unfortunately, much of this regulation has yet to be installed. Finally, public incentives should exist for active institutional outreach programs by selective institutions to encourage and support applications from high achieving low income baccalaureate students, as well as applicants from other student groups designated by national policy as warranting preferential consideration. Thank you very much for your kind consideration. <laughs>